Hi. Hello, hello, hello. Nice to see you all, or not see you all, but it's nice to be here. My name's Joga Conga, and today I'm going to be talking about realia in online teaching. Do you remember in the face-to-face -face classroom? Ah, somebody knows me, Tatiana, nice to see you. Do you remember in the face-to-face -face classroom using realia? For me, it seems like a really long time ago. It's over a, over a year since I've been in a face-to-face -face classroom uh, and I, I miss it, actually, I do miss it. But one of the things that I find did find, um, particularly with training novice teachers, was that it doesn't matter how seemingly insignificant the realia is. If you bring something real into a classroom, it tends to have quite an electrifying effect on a class. So if you, I don't know, teach food and you bring in a bag of shopping, or if you teach kitchen utensils and you bring in some things, or you empty your bag and show them what's what you usually carry around with you. These things are not particularly exciting. They're not earth shattering or very unusual, but I think the fact that they're in the classroom in a slightly unusual kind of situation means that they do feel, it does feel a bit unusual. It is a bit interesting. It adds a bit of a frisson to the class because they're different. So that was in the face-to-face -face classroom. And, uh, oh, someone says they always recommend my videos. That's really nice. Thank you, Edward. So I think that whilst there are many disadvantages of, of learning from home and teaching from home, there are some big advantages. And they're not just that I can roll out of bed in my pajamas and go on screen without, you know, putting proper clothes on at the bottom half, at least. Not just that. But I think also the fact that you're in your own environment and so you have access to all sorts of realia which may be interesting for your learners. Now, I think that personalisation in language learning is always very motivating. People like to talk about themselves. What do we know about best ourselves? What really do we like to talk about best? Ourselves. And what do we know about best? Ourselves. So I think that personalization, making it personal for the learners, is a very motivating thing in language learning. And also the fact that you're learning something about your teacher, perhaps, is, I think, quite engaging. So if you, you know, your teacher is perhaps at a little bit of a distance from you. And it will depend, of course, on the kind of learners you have. If you're talking about adult learners, it's going to be very different to if you're talking about teenage learners. But I think that curiosity is engaging. People are interested in something perhaps they didn't know and hopefully interested in you as a person. I also think that within teaching, and particularly within teaching language, that trust is very, very important. That trust is the basis of rapport. And trust is built often with that idea of sharing things with people, trusting that people will, you know, will, will, will um, react in a good way to the ways, the things that you want to share with them that are personal to you. So I think that all of these things mean that showing something of yourself is a helpful thing. I'm not saying that it should be all about you. It shouldn't be the Joe show or whoever else's show you are. But I do think that there's an element of that getting to know somebody on a personal level that reality around your home can really help. I do, however, think that perhaps it's worth setting up your boundaries. While I'm just talking about this, I would like you to put in the chat how you feel about sharing something of your life with your learners. So can you just put that in the chat now? By the time I finish talking about this slide, hopefully those things will come up. 
So as I say, I think perhaps you have to set your boundaries a bit and where those boundaries are set is really going to be very, very dependent on you. If you're the kind of person who puts a zoom screen behind you or likes to blur out, you know, where you're sitting and you don't want your learners to know too much about you. If you feel that I'm teaching teenagers, not very appropriate to get too personal, I'm not talking about being very personal, obviously, but it's not too, I don't want them to know too much about my personal life, then that's fine. Maybe this isn't for you. And maybe this is the time to go and join another, another class, another, another session at this conference. But for me personally, I, I don't mind sharing quite a lot about myself. That's how I feel about myself personally. When I meet people for the first time, I'm very happy to share quite a lot about my life with them very often. I'm a very open person. That's just me personally. So for me, this is really fine. But as I say, you do have to make your own boundaries. I'm interested in whether there's been any thoughts Somebody says, do it from time to time. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I'm not suggesting that you spend all of every lesson, of course, um, you know, talking about yourself. Uh, definitely not. I think, you know, this is a, a, an idea where a small amount can go a long way. Um, somebody says, as long as it's not ridiculously personal, obviously, yes. Um, don't mind. I love telling about my week, feel good as I'm a friendly type. Yes, I think that, you know, as I say, it depends obviously a lot on context, but I think that this is something we can think about as being perhaps useful. Okay, good. So let's look at some ideas. This is one of my, my favorite things. I'm, I've shown you a picture here and actually the real thing is just here. Can you see this? So in the chat, please, again, there's going to be a delay, but could you tell me what do you think this is and where do you think maybe I got it from? I'll show it to you always. What do you think this is and where do you think I got it from? Maybe you know this, maybe you've seen one like this before. They're not completely uncommon. And there's the picture over there. I won't keep holding it up because it's actually very heavy. Um, so uh, let's see if anybody's got some ideas about about what it might be. Love showing my flat bag. Okay, that's nice. People don't come to class to hear about me, says Edward. I think that that's true. As I say, I think that this is something that to be um, maybe to be dealt with with caution, certainly not all the time, but because if you do anything all the time, it's boring, isn't it? It's predictable. But something that's a bit unpredictable, a bit, oh, that's new, a bit of variety is, I think, can be very motivating. Anyway, I'm going to tell you about my, my thing. It's, I'll hold him up again because it's nice. I think that he is beautiful. He's made of heavy wood. He's very heavy. He weighs about five kilos. Um, and it's obviously a, a statue, a wooden statue of a man with his hands in his lap and his head in his hands. And the first time I saw it, I saw, I saw one of these, I saw one of these a long time ago, actually, um, in Australia. A friend had one in Australia and it was a tiny one. It was about this big. And I thought, oh, that looks like complete misery. Someone who is crying. That's what I thought. And a little bit later, a few months later, I left Australia and I went to Bali. And I, when I first went into the street in Bali at a, a market, there were hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds of the same statue. There were tiny, tiny, tiny ones. There were much larger ones. They were made of, mainly made of wood, but all sorts of different coloured wood, all sorts of things. And he's a particular um, religious symbol in, in, um, in Indonesia, in Bali. And he's actually praying. He's not crying, he's praying. Now, I, someone tried to hide from something, somebody said. Uh, I think he's from Africa. As I say, no, he's, he's from Bali. But, um, and I took a lot of time looking for one. I wanted one. I wanted one and I wanted a beautiful one. And I spent about three days looking through different markets, going on a little 
uh, took to a little little moped all around the island of Bali and I eventually found that one that I loved uh, in a small workshop in the middle of the countryside in, in Bali and I bought it and I posted it home and that's a long time ago, it was 1989. So I've had him for 30 years, more than 30 years. And I absolutely love him. I, I love the feel of him. He's very smooth and, and I really like it. So that's something that's very personal to me, something I really enjoyed. You could ask the learners, please tell me when, where, why, who, all of these kind of questions. You give those questions before you do the listening. Effectively, I'm doing a live listening here. You could then, of course, get them to go and find something personal about them. So I would just, again, while I'm just carrying on, please write in the chat, if you were going to do this for yourself, for your learners, what would you choose to tell them about? What would you choose to tell them about? Put that in the chat for me. So you can do this, I think, Obviously, you could do this in a face to face class. And actually, I have done and I've asked them to bring in things. But what happens in a face to face class, of course, is that in a class of I know, a dozen or 15 people, maybe three people remember or want to do it. And so you don't have everybody joining in. If you're online, you've really got they've really got no excuse. They're here. There must be something in their house that they're interested in showing people. And I think they do have a choice. You're not saying you have to show, you know, the personal thing that was a family heirloom or that your mother gave you on her dying bed and is very personal to you and makes you cry. You know, it doesn't have to, it could be something very, very simple. Um, you know, a handbag that you like or, or something like that. Could be, you could tell them, they can choose whatever they want to do. But I think that this is, you know, quite motivating. So you can do it as a live listening, so receptive skills, obviously productive skills, them talking about their life, their, their object. You could do this as a product-based or a process-based approach for this. So in this case, I've kind of taken a product-based approach as I've given you a model. I've told you what I want you to do. I've shown you what I want you to do. And I've given you some, some a framework to do it in, what, where, when, how. A brooch I made myself, a lot of vocabulary when describing. Yeah, that's that's lovely. Something that you actually made yourself, and that's great, isn't it? Because there's a real personal touch to that, something that you really like. Um, or you could take more of a process-based approach to this. You could ask them a task-based approach almost. You could get them to go and find something that they like. Just show them the thing that you like. Say, right, go and find something you like. Tell us about it, and then maybe give them a model afterwards my mug. Well, now I'm really interested, Anna, in why your mug is uh, actually particularly personal, interesting to you. You see, these things are interesting. As soon, why? Why is that mug so special? Some kind of thing from a childhood vacation, even a pet. Yes, pet would be a fantastic one. I think I've had a couple of times online where people have had their dogs or their cats there. And, and that inevitably is very, very engaging. So yeah, that's a great one. Favourite bags is a fanatic. Fantastic. Yeah, these kind of personal touches, I think, are great. So what kind of language focus could we have on this? I mean, there's all sorts of things that you could do. A description is the very obvious one. Somebody mentioned that with their, with their brooch. Adjectives, it's heavy, it's dense, it's wooden, whatever. Um, narrative tenses, a story of how you got it, why it's important to you. So those are, I think, the obvious language focuses. But you could always just also just think of it as receptive skills practice, productive skills practice. You could make a writing task out of this too. There's an awful lot that could come out of here. A t-shirt which my daughter made for me by herself. How fantastic is that? That's great. Um, I'm really liking what you're what you're coming up with as things that you would like to show your learners because I think all of these things you've just given me a tiny sentence I can already see there's a story there there's something interesting and something I'm going to be interested in it's not some random anonymous thing from a course book this is really life you know this is so I think that's great let's move on to something else how about a favorite book well you know you could always do this in class, of course, and we could do this without it, of course. But it's really nice if you've actually got 
a book to talk about. And um, you know, here's here's a favourite book for me. Um, this actually, it's not a book. You know, it's actually a book. Look, it's got lots of blank pages in, although it's got some some notes in it as well. So this is actually a notebook. It's not it's not a book, uh, a storybook. It's a notebook. It was given to me by my son for my birthday, and I tend to keep it. I'm really a digital girl. I make all my notes digitally, but I found it quite helpful to have a notebook by my side when I'm teaching online because it's quite useful sometimes just to write things down in the very old fashioned way. But you could also take something from, you know, you're like, here's my book. This is the, you know, the most interesting book that I've read. What would you choose? Please write in the chat which book you'd like. Um, you could talk, it could be a novel, it could be some kind of, you know, um, other book that's been important to you. It could be something, you know, a learning book. It could be a, a, a dictionary or a, some sort of grammar book or something which you think you could would help their development. So it could be, you know, sneaking in a bit of something there. What kind of language could we use? Obviously, book review type of stuff, kind of language focus, narrative tenses, if it's any kind of narrative, temporal conjunctions, if you're telling a story, again, descriptive language. So all sorts of different language focuses that we could use for that. Of course, you could just do this with any kind of book. But I think it's quite nice to say, look, this is a book I've just taken off my shelf. Here it is in my hand. This is the book that I like and get them to go and find a particular book. Again, I've done this sort of exercise in class before now where you've said um, someone else has got a notebook. That's nice. Um, where you've said to people, tell us about a, a favourite book that you've read. And of course, people go, oh, I can't think of anything. I can't think of a single book that I've read recently or I can't think of one that I think would be OK to share and they lose ideas. So again, just saying, right, have a couple of minute break, go and find a book, come back. I think there'd be very few people who didn't have a single book in their in their house. Even I realise that, uh, you know, screens have taken over for teenagers particularly, but I'd be surprised there weren't a single book. Even my 16 year old who doesn't read has a couple of books in his room. Um, modern literature to motivate them to read and up to date vocabulary. Harry Potter. Yeah, nice. You know, so so I think some that you think would really would, would spark their interest. And I say the thing is, it's not just about your book. It's about the opportunity for them to go and get their book and, you know, and to, to share that. So I think that's really helpful. Moving on, a picture. This is, I have three sons, three beautiful, wonderful sons. Um, and this is the middle one, the middle one drew this. Uh, and he is now 19. He's at university studying uh, illustration, unsurprisingly. And he drew this and I just think it's so fantastic. Um, and I have it on my, on my wall. So again, you know, this is something, of course, you can use pictures to describe all sorts of things from, um, you know, the net. There are all sorts of pictures on the net. It's easy to do. But I think the idea of the fact that you can see this is a picture I have up on my wall. Look, there's the next to it, there's the, the switch for the bathroom. It's in the hall. Um, so something that's very personal to me again. Why do I like this picture? What about it was interesting? The fact that it's so, you know, I think personally, I'm a bit of a proud mum, but I think it's incredibly good. Um, and it's perhaps a bit interesting. You might have other pictures that you have on your wall, maybe reproductions of famous pictures or maybe photographs of you know, family or whatever. Of course, you have to choose what you're comfortable to share. But, you know, I think there are a lot of things here that potentially you could you could do. OK, in the chat, please. Now, can you write if you were going to do this, what sort of language do you think it would suggest and what kind of picture would you like to share? So what kind of language 
what kind of picture. Put some things in and we'll see what people have got. Other pictures I have around my house, I have some um, posters of, they were sort of old travel posters, reproductions of old travel posters, I suppose. So that's something else that might be interesting to show. I also have a couple of uh, pictures that came from a holiday, pictures of a, um, a stained glass window that I was particularly fond of when we went on holiday. So I think, you know, often these things, are they're going to be personal to you. They're going to have a story behind them. So it's not just about some random, random picture, which is also useful. Just waiting to see if we've got any responses. I'll move on a little bit and we'll see what's next. Something else that you could do, I'm going to show just a part of it. Ah, that's a nice idea. Someone said, I'm going to show, I'll just go back here for this, a part of a photo for students to predict. That's a lovely idea. Yeah, really nice idea. Show them part of it, see what they think. Describing a face and emotions. Yeah, absolutely. So again, that could lead on to at lower levels, body parts and descriptions at higher levels, things about emotions. Nice. Okay. You just pass simple Leonardo da Vinci painting. Okay, yeah, where you've got something that's very narrative, a narrative kind of picture. Yeah, that's a lovely idea. And I think beautiful pictures are motivating in themselves, aren't they? So thank you for your ideas. Van Gogh's work. Yeah, I've got um, one of, a picture of one of his downstairs too. So yeah, nice. Okay, I think your kitchen is another great source of realia, a great source of things that you could that you could share with your learners. Now, you may have there are some so sort of practical issues with this. I tend to do my online teaching here with a with a desktop in my bedroom, which is upstairs. It's quite a long way from my kitchen. But I do have a desk, a laptop and I can use that to go and take somebody around my house. Or you could maybe video a little bit of something beforehand. That's another way of doing it. I've made this short video of my kitchen, I say because I can't take you down there. So I've done something a bit earlier and I'm going to show you the sort of things I'd like you to make notes on what different activities you could see, you could use in the kitchen and anything else that you think that you could do in your kitchen. You could put that in the chat. So your kitchen is quite a useful source of material. Come on into mine. A nice place to start is looking in the fridge. So this is mine. I hope you don't think it's too disgusting. The first obvious thing to look at is to look at different kinds of food. We've got all sorts of things in here. You could look here different kind of vegetables, courgette or zucchini if you're American or Australian. We've got potatoes, oops, carrots, etc, etc. So you can do basic things for your low level learners. You might have other things which then are a little bit more unusual, such as vegan soy milk. My son's a vegan mustard, eggs, etc. Once you've looked at the basic foodstuffs, another good thing you can look at are packaging. So we could have, whoops, up here, a box of eggs. We could have a jar of jam, a punnet of blueberries, a bowl of tomatoes, what else have we got? A bottle of wine. So having these all there, I just think makes it a little bit more interesting for learners. And of course you can always play Kim's game, shut the door, tell me how many things you can remember, maybe take something out and then get them to look again. Another thing that you could use are utensils. 
So this is a bowl and it's used for mixing. So it's a mixing bowl. So we've got what is it? It's a mixing bowl. What's it used for? It's used for mixing. We've got that structure. We've got a tea towel. It's used for drying up, perhaps. It's used for peeling potatoes. It's a potato peeler. It's used for opening a can. It's a can opener. It's used for mashing potatoes. It's a potato masher. So obviously you can go through these with your learners. And again, play games with them, try different things with them, and then maybe get them to show you their kitchens and look at some of the utensils and the food that they've got. Okay, so so kitchen I think is you know quite a um, potentially rich environment for all sorts of food. You could also of course do you know recipe type of stuff and look at the action verbs of cooking for example. I think it's perhaps more motivating to talk about frying and roasting and and boiling and whatever else you do steaming if you're actually showing the thing happening and yes of course there are plenty of videos or what have you or pictures you can find on the net but there's something a bit more engaging about it being you. How about other rooms? So this isn't my lounge actually I have to say I just did take a, uh, a random picture from the net here which of course you can also do. My, my feeling is that if you take a random picture from the net and pretend that it's your house there's something about that you know the trust thing that is yeah, I, I don't like it. I think it is betraying someone's trust to kind of lie to them in that way. This is my lounge. Wouldn't I, look, wouldn't I like it if it were? Um, my lounge doesn't look anything like as nice as this. But you could, I mean, it's fine to say here's a lounge. I mean, it's fine to say this is my lounge if you want to. It's up to you. Um, so what sort of things do you think? Again, can you put in the chat? Somebody's got a video reaction and just love the... The idea, that's great. Um, what sort of language do you think you could use, you could develop from other rooms, rooms such as the living room? Any thoughts? I'll tell you what I think and we'll see if we, uh, we get some similar replies as we're going along. Furniture's obviously yeah, very obvious one, isn't it? Description. So a sofa, coffee table, lamp, clock, wall clock, whatever you want to do, pictures, plants, um, cushions. What's the difference between a cushion and a pillow, for example? Uh, oh, somebody's backyard. Yeah, that's another nice idea to, to go and show in the backyard. I'm, I'm coming to that in a bit, actually, but but uh, I think that's a really great idea. Yes. Um, rug on the floor what's the difference between a rug and a carpet for example so there's all these sort of subtle things that you could do again get them to take a picture of their of their lounge come back and describe it to someone so furniture is i think the very obvious one you could also do some other work here on language though articles works really well i think for this articles and also prepositions of place and perhaps those two things combined so obviously there's a sofa and in the middle of the room there's a coffee table and on the coffee table so in the middle of the room there's a coffee table and on the coffee table there's a vase of flowers and in the vase of flowers there's a bunch of roses and whatever my my partner bought them for me maybe whatever um you know there's a sofa on the sofa there are five cushions or whatever so i think that this kind of thing you know prepositions of place it makes it very meaningful and uh the the articles thing because it's just so repetitive i think a lot of what's really valuable with uh practicing grammar is what uh, say 
Seglovitz and Gap Bonton call creative automaticity, which is essentially doing the same thing repeatedly, but in a meaningful way. So I'm not just saying there is a table, the table is big or whatever. I'm actually looking at it something in, in context, something that's meaningful to me, my, my lounge, your lounge, your backyard, whatever else. And, and I'm describing it to you. Now, you could do something like uh, you're not showing the picture yet. So I'm going to describe what it looks like to you. Maybe draw a little picture of it, a little diagram of where things are in my lounge and then I'll show you the picture. So do a bit of a reveal afterwards and you could do the same thing for um, you could do the same thing with your learners, get them in breakout rooms, get them describing their room to each other and then showing them the picture of it. I think it's quite, quite motivating because you want to see it. You want to see what somebody else's house looks like. I think when people have got screens up, you always go, oh, well, what was behind there? It's always sort of nice to see, oh, she's got the Chinese picture on the wall and, you know, whatever. So I think it's quite nice to see a bit about people's houses. I hide a toy somewhere in the room and let the students search it, telling where they should look for it. That's a nice idea. I expect, especially with you know, younger learners, um, that whole thing of you know, getting warmer, getting colder, move, go left, go right, move straight on, all of that kind of thing. Absolutely, I think it's a really nice activity. How about household jobs? Let's move on a bit further. These are all pictures of my, my house. Um, there are things here that need doing their household jobs that need to be done but they're not it's not too terrible I, I've chosen not to show you my son's my 16 year old son's messy bedroom for example I've uh, chosen things which aren't too embarrassing for me um, but I do think that all of these things there's a job that needs to be done so you could look first of all at vocabulary you might need to introduce some vocabulary washing up doing the washing, what's the difference between washing up, doing the washing, drying up, tidying up, all of those phrasal verbs with up that come within the uh, the remit of household jobs, uh, sweeping up, um, cleaning the windows, washing the windows. Do you clean the windows? Do you wash the windows? I think both are possible. Personally, I clean them usually. That's what I say. Um, sweeping the floor, mopping the floor. So you could do some work on vocabulary with these sort of things. First of all, uh, with, with with your learners to make sure matching tasks, quite easy to do that. Um, you might also want to then look at some other language focus for this. And I think what works really well for this is that idea of active and passive and causative have. So what do you need to do? active sentences, I need to, blah, blah, blah. What do you need to have done? Or what need, or what needs to be done? I guess I could have included that as well. What needs to be done? The windows need to be cleaned. So it's passive. I'm not saying who's going to clean them. I'm just saying that they need to be cleaned. I could also say, of course, they need cleaning. So there's another, another piece of language there. What do you need to have done or to get done? So that idea of that causative have. So I'm the subject here. I need to have the windows cleaned. I'm not going to do them. I loathe cleaning windows, um, but I need to have somebody do them. So what we've got, I is a subject here, need to have or to get something, the object done, past participle. And then the other nice piece of language is what you need to get someone to do, which is similar, but not quite the same. So I need, here yeah, I've got an example. I need my son, I need, sorry, I need to get my son to put his shoes away. So one on the left, tidy, on the right, sorry, tidy up. Um, yeah, somebody else had got causative and active here. That's the same idea. So here, this is another nice structure, need to get someone, indirect object, to do something. So again, that's quite a useful piece of language. I'm the subject here, but I'm not going to do the action. I'm going, well, I'm going to do the action of making my son do it, I suppose, but I'm not going to do the tidying up. I'm going to ensure that somebody else does it. 
interesting I think that this structure in British English we usually would only use get I think with this to get someone to do something I think more in American English you might say to have someone do something but I think that I wouldn't say that as a British person probably but I can hear it in an American accent um, I think the interesting thing is you, you need to have the windows cleaned probably means that you're going to get a professional to do it whereas I need to get someone to do something is often has the function of a complaint it's often wanting somebody who didn't want to do something or who should have been doing something to do it I think so I think that's a really useful bit of language and it's a very authentic context so I think authentic use is often very motivating and useful and easy to easier to understand then of course you can give your learners a screen break and tell them go and take three pictures of jobs that need doing in your house if they feel uncomfortable doing that you could just say well it's okay go and get to uh, get a couple pictures off the net if you like but better if it's something in their house and I say none of those things I think makes my house look too disgusting uh, so I think perhaps it would be okay you might also want to finish this off with some sort of discussion about um, again I'm sorry going back I think with this again you've got that nice idea of that creative automaticity you've got a real reason for repeating the same language again and again in a meaningful way um, you could finish that off with some sort of discussion maybe gender specific jobs uh, would you would you have a do you have a cleaner would you have a cleaner um, I've always thought that I would not like to have a cleaner because I think I would be too embarrassed for somebody strange to come in and clean up my mess I think I would end up cleaning up before they came that's what I think so I've never had a cleaner um, but I would understand that many working people particularly working women who's you know who the uh, onus often falls to to do the cleaning might well choose to do that so household jobs I think is quite a nice uh, uh, a nice context for language development the final one that I've got for you is this one which I call out of the window somebody mentioned before using the backyard as a context so again could you put in the chat for me what kind of language focus do you feel that you could use with taking a picture out of your window I hesitate I, ha I have to say that none of these are taken out of my window actually they're they're a bit inauthentic um, I wanted to have three quite different windows so I didn't choose my own but please put in the chat what you think would be useful language focuses or skills based focuses for looking out of your window. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to type before I launch into the rest of this. On standby for results on oh, moment okay so if you look at this hopefully you've started to write some 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 things into the chat now ah, present continuous with people and pets yes what's happening what, what what yeah there's a you know somebody is the crocuses are growing it's snowing people are walking on the street absolutely wonder what else we've got the weather yeah absolutely describing the weather it's overcast it's snowing it's cloudy it's clothes climate seasons absolutely so there's all sorts of things here we could also have looking at neighborhoods um, so terraced houses 
suburbs, cities, urban versus rural. And also I think things that are changing or have changed. So what's happened in the bottom picture, it's snowed recently, for example, something that's happened, present continuous, there is, there are, yeah, absolutely. Ah, imagining what's going on in that window. Yes, that's a lovely activity and one that I use quite frequently. So if we choose a particular window, a neighbor's window, for example, we could try to imagine what's going on in there. So block present continuous. And I think there's an interest in there too. So I think, as I say, what's changed is quite nice. You could look at what's happened recently, maybe take a picture now, take a picture in a couple of weeks time and ask them to look at the differences, something of that nature. Particularly if you've got the backyard and things, things are moving on, then, then I think that that's useful. Routines, everyday life of the city. Yeah, routines are nice, I think, aren't they? You know, with using using that that kind of thing. Talking about places in a city for sure. So this could, you know, expand outside of your direct house. Of course, it could be pictures in your neighbourhood, something of that nature. Google Earth works really well for this. I don't know if any of you have ever used Google Earth online. But that's a fantastic tool because you can go literally, you can go into your street and show them your house if you choose, and you can take them around your neighborhood. So this is you know, going up my street towards the shop where I usually buy my milk in the morning. And then, you know, down here is the local school or whatever else. So I think that Google Earth can be a great thing. That's perhaps going a little bit further away from my original premise of Realia, but it's, I think, still in the same idea of these are interesting things about my my home and my life and my environment. And say, so very easy for learners to do that too. OK, well, I think that that's probably come to about the end of what, what we, I have to say to you. So I really hope that some of those ideas have been helpful um, and that maybe you'll take them into your class next Monday morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and the rest of your day. Thank you very much for being so so enthusiastic in your posting on the chat. It's a bit strange with it being being at a at a time lag, but it's been really nice to to meet you all. Thank you very much. Bye bye.